Timothy, chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. The Word of God says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly beloved Son, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. I thank God, whom I serve from my forefathers with pure conscience, that without ceasing I have remembrance of thee in my prayers night and day, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, I am persuaded that in thee also. Wherefore, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, though of me his prisoner. But be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. But now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Whereunto I am appointed a preacher, amen, and an apostle, and a teacher of the Gentiles. For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Heavenly Father, O oh God, I pray the Lord. We go into the preaching portion of this service now, Father, as we've just finished sharing together, Lord, the precious ordinance of the Lord's Supper. And Lord, while our hearts are tender and contrite and in full remembrance of the sacrifice made for us, oh, I pray, O oh God, let thy Holy Spirit Deal with each of our hearts now, Lord. Lord, through the message that you've given to me for your people this morning. And I pray and I ask for it in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. I want to speak to you this morning on the subject of individual accountability. Individual accountability. Verse 11 in our text. Paul says, Whereunto I am appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Every time I have the privilege of standing up to preach, I'm fulfilling my Holy Spirit ordained place within the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. What a privilege and a thrill it is to do that, to know, to have the knowledge that I'm able to fulfill the place that the Lord, that the Lord assigned to me within the body. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, and Philemon are the four epistles that Paul wrote to an individual.
Timothy and Titus were pastors. Philemon was a mature Christian elder. He hosted a church in his home. Uh, and he quite possibly pastored it as well. I can't say that for sure. But in each of these, he speaks to that individual of the divine expectations for their lives. <clears throat> Four of the epistles that we have in the New Testament were written, preserved by God, an individual. And they are indeed the divine expectations. Because again, Paul is being used of God and being guided by the Holy Spirit of God. So the expectations here are not just Paul's. They are the expectations of the Lord. Now in 2 Timothy 1.11, Paul speaks to his responsibilities. Speaks to the expectations that God has of him to himself and to the church. To be a preacher, to be an apostle, to be a teacher of the Gentiles. Big order. Now, Paul's always very aware, when you read his epistles, of his individual responsibilities and the fact that he was going to be held individually accountable for fulfilling them. He presses home this fact with Timothy and with Titus, Titus and with Philemon individually but also corporately for all of his other epistles. Romans 12, 1 and 2, for example. Familiar verses. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this form, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Corporately presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice, our service to Him. 1 Corinthians 12. First Corinthians 12, we're going to look at uh, verses 13 and 14. For by one Spirit, capital S, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and having been all made to drink into one Spirit, for the body is not one member, but many, the Holy Spirit of God is the person of the Trinity who has the responsibility of assigning to each individual believer the position that they are to fulfill within the body. To you know, giving a glory, praise, honor unto the Lord Jesus Christ to provide edification for the church and to propagate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all reviewed over in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. And that everything is to be done in the spirit of charity, love and action by the believer. 2 Corinthians 5.17 2 Corinthians 5.17 Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things 
are become known. We're to remember the old man is dead. He's dead. And that we are a new creature. I mean, all the other epistles, Romans, we looked at some verse in Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, how about Galatians? Galatians reminds us, the book of Galatians, that we are saved by the Spirit, not the law. And to not look to the law for the perfecting of the flesh. No one folks that at the nursing home yet today. Reformation is not salvation. Turning over a new leaf is not salvation. Following some step program is not your salvation. It's in a person. In the Lord Jesus Christ. How about Ephesians? Ephesians, doctrinal unity and perfecting of the saints. Philippians chapter 1 deals with your joy and faith in tribulation. Philippians chapter 2 deals with humility and obedience in tribulation. Chapter 3, the causes and the curse from tribulation. Philippians 4, having confidence in peace in tribulation. How about Colossians chapter 1? Colossians 1, 9 through 12. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord in all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power and to all patience and long suffering with joyfulness giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of saints in life. Yeah. That's Colossians. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. 1 Thessalonians reminds us to be watching. Not watching for the Antichrist. Not watching for the tribulation. Not watching for signs and wonders. What are we supposed to be watching for? Coming to the Lord. Amen. 2 Thessalonians likewise reminds us that though the mystery of iniquity is already at work in the world, and why is it Okay. We've not missed the blessed hope. That's why I was writing in the second book. Hey, you ain't, you ain't missed nothing. Don't listen to the to the the false preachers, the false prophets, the wolves in sheep's clothing. The Lord will come. The Lord will come. The Lord will come to retrieve his bride when the Father has determined that it's time. And the last epistle that was written by Paul was not even addressed to us. Addressed to the Hebrews. It's intended doctrinally for the tribulation saints. So both individually and corporately, Paul has written to the church of our responsibility. When you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, you begin a journey. You begin a process that's comprised of several steps. First is a newborn spiritual baby in Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2, the first six verses. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. You get saved, <laughs> and you need to get into this thing. You need to 
sincere milk of the word. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. To whom coming as unto a living stone disallowed indeed of men but chosen of God and precious. It's a sad thing to see somebody trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior but never grow. You don't, you don't start with the first. Okay, I'm sorry, you can't skip any steps, folks. I've, I've seen so much of it. I've seen so, so very much of it. But we're expected to grow and to mature beyond being spiritual babies. <coughs> I mean, Paul admonishes the Corinthians regarding this over 1 Corinthians 3 the first four verses there 1 Corinthians chapter 3 1 through 4 and I brethren could not speak unto you as unto spiritual but as unto carnal even as unto babes in Christ I have fed you with milk and not with meat for hitherto you are not able to bear it neither yet now are you able for ye are yet carnal. For where is there is among you envying and strife and divisions? Are ye not carnal and walk as men? For a one, while one saith, I am of Paul, and another of Paulus, are ye not <coughs> carnal? Now, now, as you mature in doctrine and faith, you are to actively seek out the Lord's will for your life. Again, with Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's exactly what that's talking about. And, I mean, and in there, it gives us good will of God, acceptable will of God, perfect will of God for you individually, not for somebody else, you. Again, good will of God. That's the basics. That's the basics of Christianity, expected of every believer. Individual prayer, fellowship with the Lord, individual reading, studying, memorizing of the scriptures, individual, daily surrendering of yourself unto His will and guidance through the Holy Spirit of God, faithfully gathering together with the church when it meets, being obedient to the ordinances of the Lord's Supper, spiritual baptism, or scriptural baptism, I'm sorry, and being a faithful and competent witness and testimony to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Acceptable will includes all of the things in the good will of God, but it's somebody going above and beyond it's acceptable. God's going to bless it. But you're going above and beyond the basics in service and sacrifice to both the Lord and the church. And when a person comes to that point, that's when the Holy Spirit of God will say, you're ready now for the perfect will. And it's through those first two and the accomplishment of that, that then the Holy Spirit of God can specifically show unto you what your perfect will is in His service. And you will be gifted with the talents that are needed to be able to fulfill that specific call. God is not going to put on you something that He doesn't fit you out to accomplish and over time he may add to it say okay now I want you to do this too but again look at look at the Apostle Paul he started out as a baby Christian notice you know what his first job in church was he was a messenger boy <laughs> running things back and forth between the churches letters collecting offerings for the, the poor saints in Jerusalem and stuff like that. That's what he did. 
and he kept at it, and he got good at it. And, and eventually, one day, Holy Spirit said, separate unto me all in sight. Paul and Barnabas, the work where do I have called them? He sent them out on this missionary journey. He may add to it. He might even change it to what it suits him. That's why you've always got to be yielded, faithful, paying attention. The perfect will of God for your individual life is important. That you know what it is and you're obedient to it. You know, the process of spiritual maturing never ends in this life. <clears throat> you're not going to exhaust what's in here. That's for sure. I said in the Sunday school, man, I don't know it all. Not even close. A lot that I know, but man, I, I know I haven't even barely dipped my big toe into that pool. And as far as spiritual maturity, I don't care how far along you got. And let's say, okay, Paul, probably the greatest Christian ever lived. Okay, not gonna. You're never going to in this mortal life attain to what we've got waiting for us. So there's always room to grow. Okay, you're never going to reach a point where it's like, okay, this is all I can do, and there ain't no more to do. Okay, you think you've reached that point, then you go to God and you say, okay, <laughs> what's next? And he'll say, here you go. Okay. That's not going to end until we receive our glorified body. You know, mortal flesh always going to fight, always going to battle you. Doesn't matter how spiritually mature you get. Doesn't help. Matter how far along in the Lord you get. You know, it's going to fight you. You got to accept that fact. That's why you need to be yielded every day. That's why you need to crucify the flesh every day. It never ends. Go to Ecclesiastes with me, chapter nine. Ecclesiastes. Nine, verse eighteen, and then ten one. Ecclesiastes nine eighteen. Wisdom is better than weapons of war. What but one sinner destroyeth much good. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. So doth a little folly him that is in reputation for wisdom and honor. We ought to be careful as we grow to be sure that we don't ever allow ourselves do anything that's going to bring reproach on either the Lord Jesus Christ or on the church. Little folly. You know, him and reputation of wisdom, I've seen it. I've seen it. That, again, you're never going to exhaust what can be obtained through the scriptures. Okay. You're never going to, in this mortal life, reach the pinnacle that one day will be given when we are fully redeemed at the resurrection. Okay, nobody, nobody fully attains, nobody arrives in anything in this life to its fullest extent. So there's no room for pride. There's no room for arrogance. There's no room for a little while, you know, I know it all. I'm smarter than the rest of y'all. You know, uh-uh. Not at all. 
We're instructed, though, in Philippians 3, verses 7 through 14, Important instruction, Philippians chapter 3, 7 through 14. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. May doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dumb that I may win Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. He's not talking about I got to do something to get saved. He's talking about attaining unto the resurrection of the dead being crucified in this life. Not as though I had already attained either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press for the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Those are scriptures I strive to live by every day. To know, to conform, to attain, to apprehend, to forget what is past and what is behind and to reach forth and to press towards that mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Verse 15 Let us therefore as many as be perfect. Okay, And you are perfect in regards to your salvation. That's what he's speaking about there. Be thus minded. This is the mentality he says you all should have. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you, our Heavenly Father. Lord, individual accountability. Everybody's got to face it. Everybody has got to face individual accountability with you. By your grace, we won't be standing before you at the great white throne of judgment giving individual accountability when the books are open. Someone's already done that for us. And you've been satisfied with the travail of his soul. And so it's to him, our precious Savior, that we will give individual accountability to when we stand before his judgment seat to answer for what we did or did not do in our lives in service to him. So again, Father, on this Sunday, where we just took time to remember his sacrifice on our behalf. Lord, in the taking 
of the elements of the Lord's Supper. I pray, dear God, that we will be conscious of our individual accountability to him. We stand redeemed because of the obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's to him to whom we owe that accountability. Let us take that as serious, Lord, as we just did this ordinance. And we pray and we ask for this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's all stand. We'll sing a closing hymn together.